Welcome to the 2020 Virtual Chancellor's Dinner at the Vancouver School of Theology. Friends, welcome to the 2020 Chancellor's Dinner, Become the Chancellor's Reveal. I want to thank you, uh, those of you who have come in, in person and who are watching this program live, and those of you who will watch it by recording later. Uh, my name is Richard Topping. I'm the principal of the Vancouver School of Theology, where I've taught for 11 years, and I'm now going into my seventh year as the principal. Uh, we are meeting in strange and uh, challenging times, and so um, this event has undergone some innovation, so we can still bring you important news of developments at our school. Uh, over the course of this hour's program, you'll be meeting uh, friends of the school, faculty from the school, some of our students who have won awards, as well as a number of our board members who provide really important leadership and direction to our school. Uh, following the program, there'll be a live portion in which I'm happy to engage all of you in a question and answer uh, opportunity, and you can ask your questions in the chat box. I want to introduce uh, the Reverend Dr. Ray Aldred. Ray, this year, is not only the director of the Indigenous Studies program, but Ray is functioning as our interim dean, and we're so glad to him for that. Just before he welcomes us to the land, uh, I want to explain that the program will just proceed unannounced. Um, people will appear in succession, and you'll be delighted at the news they have to bring. Uh, before I ask Ray to give a welcome to the land, let me just introduce two of the important folks in our program and in the life of our school. First of all, our chancellor after whom this dinner is named, the Chancellor's Dinner, or the Chancellor's Reveal. It's a privilege for me to introduce Ian Black, who is the Chancellor of our school. He follows an outstanding tradition of great chancellors who have brought significant leadership to this school. Ian brings to VST a blend of both public and private sector leadership over his 30-year career. He's the president now and CEO of Maximizer Software, which is a global technology company. He's back in the technology sector after serving around eight years as the president and CEO of the Vancouver Board of Trade, which underwent a renaissance under his leadership. And before that, he spent six years fulfilling his lifelong passion for public service as an elected MLA and cabinet minister in the government of British Columbia. In engaging with VST, Ian brings to our board table not only his obvious energy and enthusiasm and a great sense of humor, but also a thoughtful perspective derived from experiences with multinational corporations, niche technology and service companies, and the hallways of senior levels of government. Along with his wife, Chris, the Blacks live in Coquitlam, where Ian's volunteer roles have included many years of coaching or managing children's soccer and hockey teams, He's also served on a variety of charity, business, and community boards, including chairing the uh, council at the science, at science World in British Columbia, and many years as a board director at Canuck Place Children's Hospice. Chris and Ian have three high school and university aged children. Next, let me introduce to you our relentlessly positive board chair, uh, Mr. Michael Francis. Michael became involved in the Vancouver School of Theology by joining the Turning Point Committee almost nine years ago. Uh, this committee was formed by the Board of Governors to deal with the fiscal realities which were affecting the life of the school. As a chartered accountant and business leader, it was hoped that Michael could bring both accounting and analytical skills to the mix of disciplines assembled on that important committee. The committee met frequently during a stressful period in the life of our school. Michael was very impressed by the dedication and competence of everyone he met here at VST. And he served also on the principal search committee, which broadened his understanding of the school and its mission. When invited to accept a, a role on our board of governors, Michael was flattered and was keen to accept. Michael has an interesting background in business and the arts. He has chaired a variety of arts organizations and government art agencies, including the Vancouver Film Festival, the Playhouse Theatre Company, Vancouver City Council's Committee on the Arts, and BC Film and Media. His own artistic discipline is painting. Michael's business activities include a professional practice, venture capital investing, and real estate development. Michael was a director of the Western International Broadcasting at the time when it was Canada's largest private broadcaster. 
He chaired the Board of Governors of BC Ferries and the BC Trade Development Corporation. He completed a term as chair of the Board of Governors of Simon Fraser University and is chairperson emeritus of SFU. Michael was honored by his profession in 2000 by being awarded the designation Fellow of the Institute of Chartered Accountants. He was also awarded an honorary doctorate from Simon Fraser University. As board chair of VST, uh, leadership, he offers leadership of the Finance and Audits Committee and additional leadership to the VST Foundation. Michael's impact has directed uh, the positive trajectory and the growth phase that VST is now enjoying. And to quote Michael, through this wide experience, I've learned some things. I know that integrity matters and that only a wonderful team can achieve wonderful things. I believe that VST is at a good time in its long life. It too has learned a lot. We have what it takes to achieve our goals. There is a committed board, an outstanding principal, a respected faculty, and an effective staff. In short, Michael says we have a wonderful team. We're profoundly grateful that Michael brings leadership to our wonderful, dedicated team. and. We're so glad that he helps to lead us here at the school. My name is Ray Aldred, and I am the director of the Indigenous Studies Program at the Vancouver School of Theology. We want to acknowledge that the Vancouver School of Theology sits on the traditional, ancestral, unceded territory of the Musqueam people. We're here as guests, and we want to conduct ourselves in a manner that enhances and furthers the vision and goals of the Musqueam people and the, really the Indigenous people of Canada, which is that we would move towards harmony with one another. And I thank you for taking the time to be part of the Chancellor's gathering. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome and good evening. It is so wonderful to gather once again, even virtually, with so many friends at the Vancouver School of Theology and have an opportunity to make yet new friends. My name is Ian Black, and I have had the pleasure and honor of serving as the Chancellor of VST for the past two years. VST is recognized as a leader in theology education, not just in British Columbia and in Canada, but around the world. At a time when changes in the church and in that world command innovation and where the world really does need the church to help lead. As Chancellor, I'm privileged to have an insider's view, if you will, at all that is happening at VST. Reflecting on VST's mission to develop leaders, I'm more convinced than ever that VST is collaborative, creative, and continues to strive for excellence in its teaching, research, and service. The VST Board of Governors, along with the Board of the VST Foundation and the VST USA Foundation, bring exemplary leadership a united passion for the Anglican, Presbyterian, and the United Churches in Canada, and an openness to Indigenous leaders and other faith traditions as a growing ecumenical school here in Vancouver, one of the truly great cities of the world. Each year, the Chancellor's Dinner is a significant moment in the life of VST. It marks the beginning of a new school year with the return of students and faculty. It is also the beginning of new relationships and partnerships, including the important work of fundraising and support building, which is vital to distinguishing VST for its innovation, excellence, and accessibility. This evening is different, however, but equally important, as it represents an opportunity to introduce the school to a growing community of followers and partners, and for all of us to learn about the great progress of VST in keeping its promise, to educate and form thoughtful, engaged and generous Christian leaders for the church and the world. The truth is that it's easy to be enthusiastic for VST. It's outstanding faculty, dedicated staff, engaged board of governors, incredible principal, and inquiring, thoughtful, and committed students from diverse backgrounds make VST a unique and very special place. To you, our friends, this is my first personal opportunity of the evening to thank each of you for your support of VST. Now, as chancellors, we carry out the ceremonial duties of presiding convocation. We don academic robes and we sign all the graduation diplomas. This is a symbolic, but nonetheless very important time for our students. 
Chanters also maintain communication with the wider world, supporting and encouraging the school. As a business and community leader, I pledge to uphold this responsibility. And chancellors lead by example. And as such, I also pledge to uphold this role with a true sense of honor and privilege. Largely thanks to the leadership of my predecessor, the wonderful Heather Clark, the chancellors have established two scholarships designed to help outstanding students in their final year of studies. Students who demonstrate great promise for ministry leadership for the sake of the world God loves. Each year, two Chancellor Scholarships of $7,000 each are awarded to students entering their final year of studies at the Vancouver School of Theology. Recipients of the award are determined at the main meeting of faculty. Our hope is that this award will encourage students in increased full-time engagement in their studies. It is now my pleasure to introduce you to this year's Chancellor Scholars and to present them with their awards certificates. Francis Kitson and Jackie Eaton. Francis Kitson is a native Vancouverite and was taken by surprise when the call to ministry came after years of working in theater and construction. She has served in candidate supply for the United Church congregations in Kelowna and enjoyed her summer leading online worship for two Okanagan congregations. She's honored and delighted to receive the Chancellor Scholarship and dedicates its use to the memory of her grandmother, Dr. Margaret Isabel Griffiths, who worked for the ordination of women in the Church of England. Jackie Graham is a mother of three children and began studying at the Vancouver School of Theology in the Master of Divinity program in the fall of 2017 as a distance education student. Located in Vernon, BC, this was a return to academia after being an at-home parent for 10 years, which was preceded by a career in public relations focusing on politics, event planning, and media communications. Jackie received her Bachelor of Arts in Political Science at the University of Northern British Columbia, where she discovered a love for philosophy, civil engagement, and a passion for community. Jackie is a postulant for ordination to the priesthood in the Diocese of Kootenai with the Anglican Church of Canada. Questioning, curiosity, and a passion for the Bible brought Jackie to VST. In these challenging days of COVID-19, Jackie says that she is reminded of 2 Corinthians 4, verses 6 to 10, and hopes that we may continue to live in a time of being perplexed, but not in despair. Let's first hear from Francis. Over to you, Francis. Hello. My name is Francis Kitson. I am a candidate for ordination in the United Church of Canada and one of this year's Chancellor's Scholars. I did not grow up in church. My family was very startled when I began attending, but I come from grandparents who were very involved. And today I think of my grandmother, Dr. Margaret Isabel Griffiths, or as I knew her, Peggy. Peggy was a practicing pediatrician in England. She was formidable, energetic, innovative. She was involved with the movement for women's ordination in the Church of England. And my mom thinks that she would have been thrilled to have a granddaughter entering the ministry. And so today, in memory of Peggy, I give thanks for all the women of the church who have made it possible for me to live into this vocation today. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jackie Graham, distance education student from Vernon, BC, mother of three kiddos and postulant for ordination to the Anglican Church of Canada. I can hardly believe I'm entering my last year of the MDiv program. The time has flown by and I have enjoyed every second of my time at VST. It has been a joy and privilege. A special highlight has also been my time as camp chaplain where I have taken turns during the past three summers. This summer in particular has been especially meaningful. The camp was able to convert to a day camp model with a maximum capacity of 40 kids. And we explored being rooted in the love of God, just like a tree. We explored making boats out of bark and finding that we were unsinkable. And we looked for nursing logs. It is a, it is with great appreciation that I thank you for this award. I look forward to the future in ministry sharing the love of Christ. Thank you, Francis and Jackie. VST is proud that you chose to pursue your theological education with us and equally proud of the leadership that you are already providing 
in the church. We look forward to walking with you in your future pursuits and following your journeys with great interest. Allow me to transition now to our board chair for some brief remarks. I knew of the meaningful difference that Michael made here at VST before I accepted the honor of becoming your chancellor. Anyone who has served with him on the board knows of his strong mind and his strong backbone and how it is all wrapped in this marvelous, generous, kind, and often funny character. We are better off today because of his leadership and his commitment to VST. And I am better off today because I can now call him my friend. It is now my pleasure to invite Mr. Michael Francis, Chair of the Board of Governors, to join our conversation. Michael. As many of you know, the Vancouver School of Theology's vision is to be called to educate and form thoughtful, engaged, and generous Christian leaders. For the past seven years, VSD has been strategically, thoughtfully, and enthusiastically led by Reverend Dr. Richard Topping. During this time of leadership, VST has emerged as one of the most innovative theological schools in the world. VST is uniquely viewed as a place for considerable imagination, possibility, and collaboration. Acknowledge, acknowledging that as VSD comes into a new era of hope and prominence is truly the work of many. Dr. Topping's leadership is without question central to this hopeful trajectory. Dr. Topping's diverse academic and practical background equip him well for this role. With a PhD in systematic theology, still active in teaching, research, and scholarly service, coupled with his years as a minister with churches in Quebec and Ontario, along with his chaplaincy service, he understands the challenges of the church and the essential role VST serves in its support. On behalf of the board of VST, we are profoundly grateful for Dr. Topping's leadership. I would now invite Dr. Richard Topping to share his thoughts and challenges with us as principal of the Vancouver School of Theology. Hi, friends. I just want to take a, a few moments of your time at our program this evening uh, to talk about uh, the Chancellor's reveal. What is it that we're revealing? Well, right now, all of us, uh, it's no secret, are going through a difficult time in this part of the world with COVID-19. It's the kind of event that really does exacerbate some of the inequities in our society already present. Uh, we've been speaking to some of our friends about uh, what a time like this means for the community and for the church. And we have been really grateful for the time that leaders have given us. Uh, we're not only a school where we teach things, we're also a school that's quite willing to be schooled by others who have things to teach us around leadership. And so we talked to the president of the University of British Columbia, Professor Santa Ono, about how he's leading in a time like this. We also talked to Archbishop Melissa Skelton about how she's leading in the context of the Anglican Church uh, in the midst of these uh, difficult times. Professor Ono, uh, these have been challenging times, really unprecedented is words that you've used in our lifetime. COVID-19 has changed educational institutions, including Vancouver School of Theology and UBC in many ways, and it's required innovation and serious adaptive change. As an important leader in education, in our province and country and internationally, what are you learning about leadership uh, during this current pandemic? Well, I'm learning many, many different things about leadership during the pandemic. Um, and it's really hard to decide where to start. But I would say probably the most important uh, thing I'm learning, and I hope all leaders are learning, is uh, the importance of humility. Because this is uh, totally unpredicted, uh, unprecedented, and uh, there is no manual or playbook on how to deal with this situation. Uh, so I think every leader that I've uh, spoken with, whether they're in the Fortune 500 company or they're head of state, or, or they are in charge of a large ministry or charge of an institution, all of them are really struggling with uh, um, knowing exactly what to do. And um, I think uh, those who are doing well uh, pause and take some time to consult with others through their networks. Uh, and to really bounce ideas off of each other about what are the different options. Uh, one of the biggest challenges is that it's not really clear 
how long this pandemic will last, yeah. where uh, the um, the numbers will grow, or whether they will be a second wave, and and so there's a lot of unknowns, a lot of question marks, is what I hear all the time. So it's very difficult to model or to plan when uh, the future is unclear. Uh, so that that's a, a second complication. The first is you don't know what to do. The second is you don't know exactly is it where where you're going. It's a moving target, mm. and so you have to be flexible. You have to be nimble. Mm. You have to be humble. Uh, and uh, the biggest mistake one can make is to assume that you understand what's what's going to happen. You mm. you that you understand exactly what steps you need to take because all of it is pretty new. Yeah. And so I would say what I have learned and what many people are learning is the importance of humility. Yeah. But the second thing is uh, embedded in my answer is the importance of uh, relying upon each other yeah. and uh, um, consulting and, uh, and, and being patient in a, in a time where many people are impatient. Yeah. Uh, I think that uh, that's something uh, that's very, very important that I have learned. I mean, my experience with some people, I didn't know what good leaders they were until they mm. let out that they're remarkably sort of adaptive and innovative, and they see opportunity where others only see trouble. And some of right. called the best of the leadership abilities out of, of people who, um, who were never interested in managing the status quo. <laughs> no, exactly. And, and, and I, do, I do think that that has implications for theological education mm. and, and the kind of uh, way we articulate uh, what a leader who is equipped for the world today and the church of the world today is all about because it's not just about the it's it would be great to have the technical skills and I, I love uh, the idea of perhaps offering that in our curriculum at PSD. Yes, yes, yes. And, and there is a whole thing about I mean you use the word adaptive I would say flexible nimble whatever you know who, who understand that that's really at the heart of ministry anyway that mm -hmm. That there isn't, there's no longer a kind of platform you stand on, and it's staying still. Yeah. Actually, it never was there. <laughs> and that, so how you respond to the uh, what you might perceive as an inconvenience or as a catastrophe yeah. or a, as a huge opportunity, how you respond to that, yeah. and how you figure out each of your moves yeah. as as that shifts is is key to to leading in a faithful way, I think, and with the spirit. And I, I cause I think that is the way spirit works mm -hmm. to, to lead in, in a congregational setting. Wasn't that great what uh, Professor Ono and Archbishop Melissa, I learned so much from my conversations with them from my own leadership here at the school during a time like this. I want to introduce you to a couple of uh, other friends of our school. One is a board member, Victor Kim. He's a Presbyterian minister in Richmond. I had a conversation with him about uh, the importance of uh, innovation and an entrepreneurial approach uh, to a time like this so that you can engage with creativity and not just lament things, but uh, live, continue to live hopefully. And then I also talked to one of our graduates, Ryan Slifka. Ryan is a minister in Courtney on the island here in British Columbia. And Ryan, of course, just two years ago was a co-winner of the Thoughtful, Engaged, and Generous Christian Leader Award. And Ryan has important things to say about how in a time like this, it's important to keep the main thing in the church the main thing. Um, Victor, what do you think might permanently change for the church in the light of, uh, of COVID-19? What are we learning? that um, you know, may be a really positive lesson for the longer term, even when things are maybe not entirely the way they were before, but more like the way they were before. I think one of the things we're learning is uh, a, sort of a holistic approach mm. to, to the person, mm. uh, rather than sort of a dualistic idea that there is a spiritual, you know, mental, or, or soul part of it and, and sort of a body part of it. We're recognizing how integrated our whole body, mind, and spirit is to our overall health. Mm -hmm. And so I think churches will be paying more inten intentional attention to the health and well-being of people that are mm -hmm. attending church mm -hmm. physically mm -hmm. um, to, to make sure that our spaces and our programs and our practices care about the entire person body, mm -hmm. mind, and spirit, right? Mm -hmm. So that they don't come to church and get fed up here, yeah. maybe have a couple of bites of here and then go, yeah, yeah, yeah. but rather they, they know that we're being, we're, we're offering care mm -hmm. and, and, and health uh, for mm -hmm. the entire, the entire person. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I thought about is, you know, when I was back in Calgary, 
we invested in the Ministry of Parish Nursing. Mm. Um, mm. And it's something that uh, I haven't seen here out in, in Vancouver in the presbytery mm -hmm. that I'm the clerk of. Uh, mm -hmm. I haven't seen any congregations that I'm aware of that mm. are invested in parish nursing. Mm. Um, mm. But there's a, there's a ministry there uh, yeah. of, of care for the, for the, for the people. Mm -hmm. uh, after, after worship, uh, a screen was set up in, mm -hmm. in the sanctuary where people could come in and, and just have a chat with a nurse on site. Mm -hmm. you know, the nurse wouldn't be doing anything that, that um, he or she wasn't um, supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And when you know, there was just some advice given, some encouragement yeah. to go see a mm -hmm. doctor, things mm -hmm. like this. But, but a lot of it was also reassurance to people mm -hmm. that, that somebody was, was, was mm -hmm. going to look at them. That somebody you know might give them a bit of encouragement to say, mm -hmm. yeah, you really should go see a doctor, or I think you think you're okay, and that's mm -hmm. natural what you're worrying about. Mm -hmm. But that ministry of parish nursing, um, again, that takes in the whole totality of body, mind, and spirit, yeah. may be something that um, that more churches might want to think about investing mm -hmm. in. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a costly, like a financial mm -hmm. investment, yeah. because there are people within our congregations. Mm -hmm. who are either nurses or retired nurses mm -hmm. uh, who might be willing to say, yeah, you know what, set up a little area after mm -hmm. church on Sundays where someone might just want to come and have a chat. Yeah, nice. Um, and and that, gives, that gives a bit of assurance to people. What about uh, theological educators and preparation? So, I mean, who would have known that when you graduated, what, in 2013, that we would be experiencing here in 2020, seven years later, um, this pandemic? But um, you know, uh, quick changes often need to be made in ministry to uh, not always just accommodate, but to minister in particular sets of circumstances. How do you think you're, um, or, or what can we do as theological schools to teach people leadership that requires a kind of innovation for times like this, to think on your feet and not get dispirited by it? What did you take from your theological education and what might we layer on to help with that? Well, I, I think that, I mean, I, I go back to my leadership course with, uh, mm -hmm. with Keith Howard, which, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, I think the Ron Heifetz book, mm -hmm. uh, Leadership on the Line. Yeah. Um, I, I think that, I mean, he makes a difference between adaptive and technical changes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that um, when, uh, I mean, like, I, th I think that, Theological schools shouldn't worry about training their ministers in technologies mm -hmm. so much because that's not really what they're in the business of. I mean, these are these are skills that you can find and pick up elsewhere. And if you're a millennial, I mean, as time goes on, more people are just yes. more people in church will will will. I mean, after this, more people will sort of be a little bit more attuned to technology. Yes. Um, but I I think that it's I think that it's it's building on the the, uh, the those sort of sorts mm -hmm. of uh, the adaptive changes, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the start with why questions, keeping the main thing the main thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I think that uh, trying to help leaders focus on what truly matters, like the gospel, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. changing lives, making disciples of Jesus, yeah. and 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 equipping them to to be able to keep that in the front of their ministry at all times. Mm -hmm. I think that our danger with, with stuff like this is that, and my danger too, I think was getting caught up so much in uh, the little detail things about how are we going to do this? How are we going to do that? But, mm -hmm. but having confidence in, in, in uh, that in God and, and the work of the spirit that somehow um, God will give us the gifts mm -hmm. to be the church where we need to be as long as we know, as long as we have, uh, you know, as long as we have the right message, mm. uh, the right um, uh, sense of our own selves as disciples mm. and our mission, then I think the other stuff really falls mm. into place much yeah. more easily. Mm. Mm. Uh, a friend of mine says the thing that, that he has learned from this is that uh, people can change. <laughs> I mean, uh, those of us even. in the, the reformed tradition have been, yeah. uh, you know, very reluctant to say that people can't yeah. change, yeah. you know, uh, but, but by the grace of God, I mean, like part exactly. of that is, I mean, um, mm -hmm. Brueggemann has a great quote that's something like, um, mm -hmm. 
he, he said to a bunch of pastors, he said, the world you were carefully preparing yourselves for is being taken away from you mm. by the grace of God. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I think that that's part of it too. I mean, I, honestly, I like, um, uh, it, does, it does suggest just the incredible stress that change puts on all of us. So mm -hmm. I, I sort of have so much more sympathy for all those old church people that I was like, oh, these people need to be, you know, these people yeah. really need to change their ways and open. But I, but you know what? The world is changing so quickly. And, mm. and uh, maybe, maybe, I mean, maybe the church, not its structures, not its mm -hmm. particular ways of doing things, but maybe the gospel needs to be that foundation yeah. that people yeah. can cling to in times like these. Mm. Yeah, you you wake up on Easter, and it's not like an Easter you've ever had before. It's all kind of like the first Easter. It was disoriented. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't have Cheerios though, and no. uh, you know they didn't have uh, you know flannel pajamas, and <laughs> yeah, but yeah. Uh, but uh, isolated, yeah, from yeah. away from each other for sure. Yeah. Thank you, Ryan and and Victor, for your insights about leadership in a time like this and keeping the main thing the main main thing. You know, friends, in, in the midst of the COVID-19 crisis, uh, other items of cultural importance have come to our attention, particularly uh, the scourge of racism. Uh, here at VST, we are incorporating into our curriculum um, new ways of learning and engaging so that we alert our students to the challenge of anti-Black racism, anti-Indigenous and anti-Asian uh, racism here in this part of the country. Uh, I had a really quite an interesting conversation with the recently appointed General Secretary of the United Church of Canada beginning in January of next year, Michael Blair. And we had a chance to talk about uh, anti-black racism in the context of the mission of the Christian Church. I found that conversation so enlightening and helpful uh, to my own work as a theological educator. When um, the anti-black racism uh, conversation started, we came together again and said it was important for us to um, engage collectively in a response. I don't think any one of us can do the heavy lifting and the work that needs to be done. All of us need to do it together in the, in the sense that the Christian church has been um, one of the places where um, racism is, is, lives in our system. You know, when you think about the fact that um, a number of our uh, established black churches started because black folks weren't welcomed mm -hmm. within the, con the confines of white churches here in Canada. Um, you know, Union United Church in Montreal, that's part of its story, it was not welcome. So it, it created a space for itself and, and other black uh, churches across the country. Uh, that's part of its history. It was not welcome. And so it, it, it had to find a place. You may remember a time when um, it was considered <laughs> sinful for a black man and a white woman or a white woman and a black man to be, to be married. The, the church frowned on that and, and, and excluded that. The church has a history. A lot of the church wealth comes from its um, role within um, slavery transatlantic slave. And so it was important for uh, the churches, uh, these churches who have some history to be get, come together and to make a statement. Yes. Yeah. Our starting point in the statement was to, to own the fact that anti-Black racism was a challenge mm -hmm. because within the Canadian context, within the church in Canada, we will talk about racism mm -hmm. as if it's, it, it's not related to people. And because of our work uh, in right relations with the Indigenous people, we tend to think about racism in the context of, of the Indigenous community, yes. but we don't think about racism within the context of other marginalized group. And so it was important as a starting point for us to say that we had to say something about the reality of anti-Black racism. And then that gave us the kind of framework and foundation to say, so what are we going to do about anti-Black racism? Yes. So that's, that's a starting point. Friends, I want to talk to you now about uh, what I think is really exciting news here at the Vancouver School of Theology. Uh, this fall at VST is really quite amazing. Uh, we've had to go online because of the challenge of COVID-19, but that's presented us with new opportunities. Uh, we knew 
We had a hint that this might happen this summer when we had record enrollment in our summer school. We had almost 200 uh, course registrations in summer school. That's up by 45%. Uh, summer school became available to people who might not have otherwise been able to travel to Vancouver to be a part of it. Uh, you, can be, you can bet in future uh, summer schools, we will make the hybrid classroom now the new norm so that we can include as many people in theological education as we possibly can. It was a real boon for our Indigenous summer school, too. As some of our students who travel from around the world, particularly the South Pacific, uh, they struggle to get the necessary travel documents in time to be there. And sometimes they're frustrated by not being able to come. With the online option, now we have people in Oceana who, if they can't get the visa, have an option to learn uh, from home. And we're really excited about that. Um, as a, the principal here, I'm also a professor. I'm teaching a course in Introduction to Theology this fall, and the classroom for me is pretty typical of what it is for other professors. I have in my Intro to Theology class 40 students uh, on four continents learning together in that classroom space. It's really exciting. Uh, VST has record enrollment. We had hoped for our 50th anniversary to have 50 new students, and we had 50 last year and 58 this year. Uh, we now have three students uh, coming into the PhD program in conjunction with uh, Durham University. Uh, since 2017, course enrollments at VST have increased 45%. Uh, it's a rich, diverse student body. We used to say we wanted our students to have global experience, uh, experience the global church, and that meant we sent them somewhere else. Well, the global church, friends, has come to us. They're with us. Uh, in the classroom. We have students from Indonesia uh, studying with us at midnight on, on the camera uh, there in the Zoom classroom. Um, still, our main partners, of course, are the Anglican, United, and Presbyterian churches. They make up over 80% of our student body. But we have this growing international component, which is a reminder to us that while our story here about the vibrancy of Christianity, we're really trying to reach out as we struggle to do mission in a culture we thought we owned. Now we're meeting people from the international church, where the church is growing um, hand over fist in some instances. For example, in Indonesia, they have 500 seminaries, and they bring something of the vibrancy of Christianity in that locale right into our classroom. We're working on agreements with Jakarta Theological Seminary in Indonesia, as well as St. Andrews, an Episcopal Seminary in Manila. And we'll be able to exchange uh, classes, visit one another's schools virtually. The costs are kept minimal, but the experience is maximal. And we're so excited about uh, what's going on this fall. We have 171 students registered in at least one course and a full-time equivalency, which means if you boiled it all down and had everybody take three courses, we have 90 students now, which is a huge increase over just recent years. If you look at the chart, uh, the enrollment has increased at VST. And I think this is the result of excellent recruitment, excellent professors, and a clear sense of direction at the school. VST is called to educate and form thoughtful, engaged, and generous Christian leaders. And our mission, our vision, has gained traction uh, in the world of the church, not only locally and nationally, but now internationally. And we are just amped over this wonderful uh, new reality that is the life of our school. So, uh, friends, this, this year has uh, created its challenges for us. Um, we have lots of students. We have them online, but we're hoping they're going to come back to the building. And uh, when we anticipate the year that's coming, we want to make the most of our 50th anniversary in 2021 to make sure we're ready to accommodate uh, the numbers of students that have come to us. Uh, we have a variety of projects planned for our 50th anniversary. Uh, in some instances, you can plan a project that's optional. The projects we're planning are essential uh, to keeping to our mission and to accommodating the students that are, are coming to us. Uh, one of the projects for the 50th anniversary is just delightful. The faculty uh, are doing a book together. And the book will introduce people to the work of Vancouver School of Theology. Each scholar who teaches here will be giving a, a kind of popular introduction to the area of their scholarship so that we can use it in recruitment, we can use it in orientation, and we can use it to introduce all of you to the life of our school and the important work that takes place here.
Uh, we are in arrears, frankly, to our graduates uh, of May 2020. That graduation didn't happen in May uh, because of enhanced protocols. We then moved it to September and it didn't happen then. They have showed great patience. Our plan is to have a double convocation in May of 2021. And we're looking at using the Chan Center which is a wonderful venue and honors the hard work that our students have done. I have to say that we deferred convocation twice and did not get a single complaint from any of our students. They understand the times we're in and they're already showing themselves to be astute leaders, uh, going back to work, taking up the work for which they train, even while they put graduation on wait. Um, others of the projects that we're planning, of course, we have a new dean, and we're almost ready to make a press release about that. We expect the new dean to start next summer. Right now, we're conducting interviews with potential candidates for our new center or our new project around congregational vitality and congregational flourishing. Uh, we're down to a short list, and our expectation is that that director will begin in January 2021. Congregational ministry, preparing people for leadership and congregational ministry, our partnership with the church is absolutely essential to the work we do. Right at the end of our vision statement, it says we're preparing Christian leaders for the 21st century. And these are new ways in which we want to do that in that crucial and important partnership uh, with the Church of Jesus Christ. At the heart of our operations here at the Vancouver School of Theology are really our students. Uh, this year has been a difficult year for some of them. Uh, summer work that they ordinarily would have been able to obtain, uh, they've been unable to get. Uh, we recognize that here at the school and we have done our utmost to support our students. Uh, this fall, we increased bursary support to up to 70% of tuition costs. And we have had record applications for student support and we've been able to meet that demand. So friends, let me say how grateful we are for your partnership that has brought us to this moment in the life of the Vancouver School of Theology, where we have the largest entering class this fall that we've had since 1971 in terms of just numbers of students beginning programs. Uh, these kinds of things are never achieved by just a few people. They're achieved by really important partnerships, by people who are grasped by a vision, who understand that the work that the school does here at Vancouver School of Theology has gravity for our time and place and culture and for the church. Uh, we have been entrusted with a mission and we're preparing people to participate in Christ's mission to the world that God loves. Uh, we invite your continued support. Uh, we can't say how thankful we are to all of you who have uh, helped us uh, in the endeavor to do theological education that is faithful and relevant in this time and in this place. And we believe we're doing that. Uh, we encourage your generosity and continued support. Uh, if you have any inquiries, any questions, uh, there'll be opportunity later in this program to ask live questions, but I would be grateful for your emails, for your phone calls. I would be pleased to speak to you about the work at VST. And just remember, if I can do a riff on Bonnie Henry, be thoughtful, be engaged, be generous. Amen. In addition to being chair of the board of the Vancouver School of Theology, I'm also chair of the Finance Committee, and we've been working with the principal over the last several months in order to prepare the school for its 50th anniversary. And the way we're doing that is a way that we hope is going to enhance student experience, enhance the spiritual experience, and make the school a much better place for all our stakeholders. And to tell you more about it, Richard Topping will now show you some of the details. Thanks so much, Michael. Uh, Vancouver School of Theology has a really pleasant problem. And the problem is this. Uh, we have larger classes than our present building can accommodate. Uh, we're here in the Epiphany Chapel just now because this is one place that we're looking to, uh, to acquire more space for our growing school. 25% of our students are online, but there are growing numbers of bodies in the room for theological education, and we want to expand our footprint to accommodate that. Here in the Epiphany Chapel, we have done some engineering and code studies to see what use we can make of this building uh, for our growing school. And at the main building, we are also uh, looking at how we can increase our footprint 
there and recover space uh, for these larger classes. Uh, Vancouver School of Theology already has over a million dollars in hand uh, to uh, help uh, support this endeavor, and we'll be looking to you, our partners, uh, to help us as we uh, fulfill our calling to prepare thoughtful, engaged, and generous Christian leaders uh, for the future of the church. Thank you so much. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's almost time to wrap things up. This has been a wonderful evening of, of thoughtful, engaged, and generous dialogue among old friends and new, even although we've had to do it six feet apart. We want to thank you for joining us this evening and for your continued support of VST. All of us here at VST are so very grateful for your faithful participation, especially at these difficult times. We want to encourage you, urge you actually, to continue with us on our journey as, it, as we strive with courage and purpose to be a full partner with the church and an important message bearer of the church into the world. As VST continues to pursue more collaboration and open its doors to seeking ecumenical community, it does so with the strength of its founding partners, the Anglican Church of Canada, the Presbyterian Church in Canada, and the United Church of Canada, and with the intent of magnifying its impact in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada, and indeed around the world. In these pursuits, we again invite your full participation. Tonight, you have a further opportunity to express your support of the work being done at, with, and through the Vancouver School of Theology. With all the outstanding work that you have heard more about this evening, VST's ability to sustain these efforts is fully dependent on the generosity of you and others. This is especially true now, as VST recognizes that its students need more support than ever, and that the church needs more leaders than VST is producing for a time such as this. Well, our evening has come to an end. I just want to remind you that opportunities to support the Vancouver School of Theology, and in particular, its Indigenous Studies program and student scholarships, uh, that's available to you through our website. If you go to our website, VST Donate, you can find there uh, the opportunity to do that. I also wanted to remind you that 2021 is our 50th anniversary. And we are looking at ambitious projects here on the campus to accommodate our growing student body. Uh, we're looking at the possibility of rebranding Epiphany Chapel as Reconciliation Chapel. Imagine that on the campus of the University of British Columbia, on one end, the Reconciliation Pole, the Totem Pole, and on the other end, the, the uh, north end of the campus, you would have the Reconciliation Chapel. Please watch for news of that. And uh, we hope that you'll offer your generous support. Thank you. Hi friends, welcome to the live portion of our program for this evening. Uh, this gives us an opportunity to interact a little bit about uh, uh, some questions you might have about the plans that you heard in the video presentation just offered. Uh, we're really glad that you have chosen to join us tonight for uh, this live interview. Uh, I've already received a few questions that people have asked, so I'll start with those. And if you would like to uh, put your questions in the chat box, we'd be uh, glad to uh, address uh, your, your concerns in interests, comments. Uh, someone asks, what will the Congregational Vitality Project accomplish and how will you engage the community? Well, this project really comes out of conversations with the community. We recognize that in uh, a lot of our uh, national offices of our churches, uh, there is less uh, help than there used to be because of some kinds of financial constraints. And VST wants to be a good partner to our, uh, the churches that we support. So what we're doing is drawing expertise in-house uh, where our students will learn about congregational vitality, but also people currently as practitioners of ministry uh, can come there and we will uh, collect and curate and then distribute resources that will be helpful around congregational flourishing, especially through community engagement. Uh, we did a study, looked at denominational materials around congregations that are flourishing and found one thing was for sure in all cases, congregations that flourish have a mission, have a real engagement with the community around them. And it creates a sense of vitality and belonging and energy and meaning uh, in the
the service of God. So that's really the idea at the root of this uh, project for Congregational Vitality. We managed to get a grant from the Murdoch Trust in the U.S. to fund this for three years while we look for funding to continue it again through the future. And as I was saying in the video, we're down to a short list. We're interviewing two candidates in the next couple of weeks and hope to make that person known uh, to the public uh, around VST and to our church partners in the very near future. A second question is asked here. Um, you've been the principal of VST for seven years. Uh, what's your future at VST? Um, I think it's safe to say uh, now the board has decided uh, at its last meeting that uh, I have been given another uh, a contract for another five years at VST. I've been here for 11, four years as a teacher and then seven years as principal. And so we're looking forward to some more time together uh, so that things that are, how shall I say, simmering can come to a full boil and we can get some really important things done in 2021, which is our anniversary. So we're looking forward to that. And I'm looking forward to uh, more time as leader here with such a great groom, a group of uh, people uh, to work with staff and uh, students and faculty in particular. Uh, so that, that's a bit about my future. Uh, someone asked about the book that we're writing together. Could I say a little bit more about that? Uh, the faculty just meant today to talk about what they want to call the book. The book is really an introduction to uh, seminary education. Uh, it comes out of lectures that all the faculty have done in orientation, where we talk to students about the 10% of what we teach that's really important for them to know if they're going to succeed. So it's a kind of theological 10% view, but that's sort of internal talk. We want to market it around for people who are going to seminary so that they can just kind of test their calling uh, to taste what kind of um, studies they may be engaging in should they come amongst us. And of course, our faculty are wonderfully interesting people and uh, the process of the book was very enjoying, enjoyable itself. Each of us wrote a chapter, then subjected it to the kind of interrogation of our colleagues. And it's made it a stronger, more delightful book. And in some cases, a, a more uh, humorous book as well. Those discussions were wonderful. Uh, one, one other um, a uh, question I have here is, uh, I love the idea of renaming the Epiphany Chapel as a place for reconciliation. Can you share more details about the plan for the chapel, what it will enable, and how much of an investment it will require? Well, the last part of that question, we're still looking into how much of an investment will it require? What we really need to accomplish down there is that this is a building coming to the end of its life cycle. Uh, we need to put on a roof. Uh, we need better windows to, uh, to, to make it uh, a more efficient building. And we need a place for our students to gather. So those three elements are really front burner for us. A student gathering space, likely in the lower area where the acoustics are a bit difficult right now. And then a renewal of the roof, including some insulation and windows windows, which will, as I say, make it an efficient place. Uh, uh, we're greening the building at the same time as we're renewing it. Uh, we have used the chapel space as a teaching space. It's great for public lectures. Uh, and so that, that's the kind of renewal we're doing to make it an efficient, uh, useful space for our students and for the life of uh, Vancouver School of Theology. Um, one of our students, here's a comment. This is lovely. He's, she says, worshiping in the chapel together is the thing I miss most now. It's such a beautiful, warm space. And boy, um, I think many of us are discovering is that we're not as introverted as we imagined. It will be great to be in each other's company again soon. Um, and um, one member of the board congratulates me on the renewal of my contract. Uh, well, they, uh, they were there for it. So that's, <laughs> that's wonderful. Um, I think th those are our questions for now. Um, I just want to draw um, the, the uh, evening to a conclusion with a series of thank yous. I want to thank our development department at VST. Boy, they have transitioned uh, to do this kind of work, in particular, uh, Ian Shea, who's standing right here in the room now, and Tom Barakoff uh, for their production of tonight's uh, program for our IT department, uh, for uh, Ethan and Hunter, who have helped so much with uh, this occasion. I want to also say thank you again to Michael Francis and Ian Black for their generous investment in the program and life of our school, their energy, relentless goodwill and good humor, uh, together with the rest of an outstanding board. It really drives the school forward into an innovative, imaginative, and I think a faithful future. 
I want to thank and congratulate again our students, uh, Francis Kitson and Jackie Graham. Not only did they win the Chancellor Scholar Awards, but I think they both distinguished themselves tonight by their on-screen performance. Uh, good news that you might want to know about is Francis has just got her first job in a two-point charge in uh, Saskatchewan, where she will begin in January, uh, likely at a different temperature. Uh, I want to thank also uh, our friends, Archbishop uh, Melissa Skelton, President Santa Ono, the Reverends Ryan Slifka and Victor Kim, as well as the Reverend Michael Blair for appearing in our program this evening and for sharing their wisdom with us in the midst of the times that we're in. Um, if you want to see the longer version of these interviews, uh, you can check out VST's Facebook page where there's a link to the uh, about 15, 20 minutes uh, with each of them. I want to also thank, uh, say a big thank you to our faculty and staff who in this past eight months have been unbelievable. They have been resilient, they have been resourceful, and they have been reliable leaders uh, in the midst of a big pivot. Everything is online, um, all of our operations are online, and all of our classes are, are online. And I have to say, I have not received a single complaint, occasionally uh, a request for some help, but lots of wise and innovative um, advice to make us better. Uh, they are all of them uh, examples themselves of thoughtful, engaged, and generous leadership. Finally, I want to thank all of you for attending this evening and for your support. Uh, VST really depends on, it, on the, the prayers, your generous prayers and your generous gifts. Uh, your investment in, our, in the program this evening uh, has helped our students and will help to go to support our Indigenous Studies program. But as you've heard, 2021 promises to be a really important year in the life of our school. We're going to be expanding our teaching space. We're going to refresh Epiphany, uh, become Reconciliation Chapel. And you'll be hearing lots more about that in the days to come. I hope that when you hear that, um, you will make an investment in the Vancouver School of Theology to make it better right now, but also invest in the future of our school as more and more students are coming to us to prepare uh, to carry out the calling that God has laid on their lives to serve God very often in congregational leadership, but in other venues that are adjunct to the work of the church. All of the students that come to us are just amazing people with wonderful stories to tell. Uh, one of those amazing people uh, we're, are, is going to sing us out of our program for this evening. Her name is Astrid Melaratan, and Astrid is a student at Vancouver School of Theology in a master's program, and she is from Indonesia. Uh, tonight, she's going to sing for us uh, the goodness of God. And I just want to say good night and thank you very much for uh, coming and being with us this evening. Thank you.
Goodness of God.